morning from sunny, sunny Kiev in the Ukraine. So I thought a good thing to do to get a bit of history and imagery of the city is that there are 20 statues or about that, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, small little bronze gold statues around the city of Kiev. And each one symbolizes a part of the history and the culture of Kiev. So I thought, what a great content for a video rack up the views possibly if uh, we try and find and go around and search for them so let's go on a hunt mm -hmm. this is Ukrainian hero I have to read it because the pronunciation is quite bad Grielo Kozumiaka and he's a very famous Kievan fairy tales, like Ukrainian fairy tale. And he's seen here, as you can see, fighting the dragon that would save Kiev. So, Kozumiaka literally means the one who soaks leather. Because apparently he lived by the Dnipro and he would like soak leather and stuff like that. He was like a leather tanner. And uh, one day a dragon, about 2000 years ago, was, uh, people are looking at me, which is quite funny. But uh, I've got mixed got uh, so a dragon was, about 2,000 years ago, a dragon was stalking Kiev, and the prince, along with all the Kievan people, said, Hey, yo, Kriolo, mate, could you come help us with this? And uh, he said, yeah. So he took his, his little club that weighed about 16 kilograms, I think it said, and they fought fiercely, and he eventually sw uh, slayed the dragon. But there's no physical evidence for this because he scattered his ashes, crushed his bones, and scattered the ashes to the four winds. Um, yeah, so this is one of the statues commemorating the fairy tale of uh, this Kievan hero. So here we have statue number, whatever this number is, because I don't know how I'm going to edit this, but this is Samson. Samson, the biblical Old Testament tale, tearing the lion's jaw, and it's about this fountain. So this fountain apparently is the oldest fountain in Kiev, built in 1748 uh, on the site of a holy spring. And legend says that if the fountain should dry up, then the fate of Kiev, well, it, it wouldn't look good, let's say that. And they say that if you drink from the fountain, drink the water from the fountain, you will forever live in Kiev. And if you rub the statue, you will forever be strong, you will gain strength. So. Give it a little rub, but uh, yeah, all this fountain in Kiev. Apparently, a meeting place for all Kievans as well. And also, just to look around as well. Soon after I went into the supermarket to grab a sandwich and I found these pictures of Samson the lion chilling out and grabbing a beard together, which I just thought was really weird. And behind me here, we're in the um, former dockyards or part of the, or part of the former dockyards of the uh, Dnipro River, where a lot of the ships would be built and then set sail into the Black Sea as part of the Soviet Union. And here we have a memorial for the sailors who uh, gave their lives and fought bravely in the Great Patriotic War from 1941 to 1945 over Nazi Germany. And you can see that here, 1941 to 1945. You know, the Soviet Union, and you, you've probably heard this a billion times, but the Soviet Union lost more than all the countries in the war combined. They lost something like... I mean, the, I mean, the, the battles were so big and bloody that there were over a million casualties in it. And uh, you know, this is part of the commemoration that would have been built after the war uh, to honour those who gave their lives and sacrificed the, you know, themselves for this. So here is the other statue. So this is... Uh, of the sundial by Pierre Perrolion, 
And basically he was a French guy who came to Kiev in the 1700s to teach French to children, but turns out he was very good at math, so ended up teaching at the university. And so he, there's two sundials in Kiev, this is one of them. And um, yeah, it's, so it's got this like green roof on it, the actual one, not this, but it's got green roof and this cube here, and it's a sundial and it's only accurate for actually half of the year because uh, this was built before daylight savings was implemented. But, um, but this is uh, in the city of, uh, sorry, the part of the city of Padil. And Padil, as you can see, is like the, the very nice part of Kiev where like a lot of the kind of official buildings are. Like this is the Radisson Hotel, very fancy. And uh, also if you wanted to ever find like all the, the hipster places and the cafes and the cool bars and all the trendy people who are wearing like very cool clothes, Padil is the place to go. It's where like a lot of the kind of youth kind of hang out. Where the youth hang out. God, I sound so old. But uh, yeah, so this is statue numero whatever we're on. And yeah, the sundial. You know, whenever, whenever I went, whenever I was asking a Ukrainian person, oh, what should I see, where should I go? And, so, and obviously, because I'm about 20-odd, 20 24, 20, 25, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people were like, okay, go to, I would hang out with people of my age, so you'd be like, oh, go to Padil, you'll love it, you'll love it. And, um, you know, Dobre. And uh, so this is probably the least Soviet place in the whole city. You know, like it's very 1700s architecture, uh, early 1800s, and uh, yeah, you can just see it in everything around here. But so that's why it's got very like uni hipster arty vibe. It kind of reminds me a bit of um, New Orleans in a way, because like that French style of architecture. Right, so here is one of the statues, the Kiev Candied Fruit. So apparently the area of Padil is quite famous for its industrial production of candied fruit and tinned sweets and all that stuff. So apparently it's been going, the idea of candied fruit has been going in Kiev for since about 1380s or something like that. And yeah, they used to serve fruit to the weddings of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania. You know, when, you know, this was part of the Lithuanian Commonwealth or, you know, close to the Lithuanian Commonwealth. So, um, yeah, not too much to say on this one. Candied fruit. So, this one is simply called Kiev Brick, but it's actually something called uh, Plinth Brick, which means wide and uh, baked stone. And uh, so it's here, it's significant to Kiev because this is what they used. Uh, both the Byzantines and the Ukrainians used the same kind of brick to build their buildings in the 10th and 13th, to the 13th centuries. So this is why it was included in the statues. So when I talk about the diversity of the architecture of the former Soviet countries, really any city obviously has a diversity in architecture, but to go from where I'm living in Obolon, in the north of the city, which is very like Soviet commie blocks, to, you know, this, the colorful, like downtown area of, um, I forgot the name already, but it's here. Uh, you know, it's just incredible, like, it's so beautiful. Especially, it helps that it's a sunny day as well. It's, God, it's hot. But uh, Kiev, yeah, it's absolutely, it's very diverse, very cool. So here we have another statue. This is uh, Kiev Coffee, just outside a big coffee place here. And uh, so the first mention of coffee, apparently, was during Volodymyr the Great's time, which was about 900-ish. And uh, so apparently it's never mentioned again until the 1700s when it became popular, it started to become popular again in Europe. And uh, so this is just a little coffee table here. And uh, so quite famously, a lot of foreigners, like there was a Prussian guy, uh, I think a Frenchman and, and a Polish dude, they all came to Kiev to set up coffee shops. 
And in fact, coffee shops were so popular in the city that when the first telephone station opened, uh, an owner of a coffee shop bought the first number. So if you wanted to make a reservation for the coffee shop, you just have to dial the number one. So uh, anyway, but unfortunately, when the Ukraine got their independence at the end of the First World War, uh, you know, coffee was extremely hard to come by due to shortages, shortages and currency, currency problems. So we didn't actually get to, Kiev never really saw a resurgence of coffee until the Soviet thaw at the end of the uh, 80s, beginning of the 90s. So I forgot to mention how coffee came to Kiev is uh, Arab traders sailed up the Dnieper and uh, they gave, they traded coffee with the uh, tribesmen who were here. So that is why the Arab word for coffee is kava. So I've probably butchered that pronunciation, correct, correct, uh, correct pronunciation right here. And then, so, and then the, the Ukrainian word, which is the same as the Polish one, uh, kava. So very similar words. And so that's how coffee came to Kiev. So this is another statue of Kiev. So this is about the uh, aeronautics inventor, engineer, Igor Sikorsky. So Sikorsky, you know, on this very street, he was a young lad and he uh, used to love the handmade helicopters he used to make, based off of the original designs by Leonardo da Vinci and his helicopter. So eventually he would study about naval engineering, pardon me, about <laughs> naval engineering. But I think he changed his mind and switched and studied aeronautics at the Polytechnic University here in Kiev. Very loud. So eventually he moved to Paris and then became a citizen of the USA where he invented the hydroplane and eventually did the first in-flight fueling over the Pacific and Atlantic in the uh, 60s and 70s. So, uh, yeah, and it goes to show that whatever your dream is, you can achieve it, just like Igor Skovsky did. So that was the Kiev computer, because the first electronic computer was designed and built in Kiev by the Kiev Institute of Electrotechnology. It took a while to remember that one, actually. But, um, yeah, it was about 60 meters squared and occupied the small part of a... Uh, two-story building and uh, yeah Sergei Lepidev was the bloke who headed his all the scientist at the time so this little statue is uh, to represent the velodrome or velodrone. So essentially, this place here was opened back in 1913 as part of the 300th anniversary celebrations of the Tsar Romanov dynasty, you know, the, uh, the Russian Empire rulers, so, uh, which Ukraine was a part of. So this was uh, refurbished many a times, 1939, 1947, I think. Then eventually it was redone completely for because uh, a couple of games were held here for the 1980 Olympics in, in the Soviet Union. And so, uh, yeah, this is just another part of Kiev that you know used to be quite grotty a hundred years ago, but now has seen some major refurbishment and now it's just a really pleasant area. Like a lot of Kiev, it's completely changed. So obviously flags are a big part of any nation, but uh, the Ukraine, pardon me, I don't think I've ever seen a country that adopts more its national colours than Ukraine does, the yellow and the blue. So you can see a couple of flags down this street, and literally like buses, signs, yeah, pretty much anything you can think of will how to try and squeeze in that colour scheme. But uh, for those of you who don't know what the Ukrainian flag uh, what symbolises, it's, it's the blue skies above, and it's the, uh, wield, uh, the field of wheat that is the gold and the yellow below. 
So it kind of symbolizes the sky and the fields, you know? So that's what the Ukrainian flag means. So here in Shevchenko Park, named after the Ukrainian writer and also the university, you know, Shevchenko University. So this is a little statue of two old men playing chess in the park, which, you know, a common sight, as you can see here. Yeah. A couple of dudes playing chess in the background, just here. You know, wherever you go over the Soviet Union, or basically anywhere in the world, whether it be backgammon or chess or drafts or... Uh, I can't remember the name of the Chinese board game, but um, you'll find something going on. But yeah, come to Shevchenko Park and uh, yeah, play some chess, I guess. On to the next one. So this may just look like an ordinary shoe, but this symbolizes the life and times of Serge Lafar. Excuse me for the pronunciation. So Serge Lafar was a Kievan-born young man, started practicing ballet at the age of 15. And when he was 18, he went off to Paris to, well, he joined at 18, Paris Ballet Company, eventually becoming a ballet master, and in 1940, when the Germans rolled in, he ended up taking the position of ballet company director and administrating the whole affair and the ballet. He was awarded this, the Golden Shoe, for 25 years of service to ballet. And then he died in Switzerland in the 1980s, and uh, he's buried outside of Paris, and his gravestone reads, Serge Lafar from Kiev, and he always fell in love with, uh, he always loved his homeland in Ukraine, never forgot it. And that's the story of Serge Lafar, and he's, uh, he's right outside the Premier Palace, so a very, very nice spot actually. So this is a letter written in Hebrew, and it's the oldest recorded uh, letter from the Kiev and Rus times in the 11th century AD. So this letter is basically a... It's got the first mentions of Kiev, by the way, in the Hebrew Kiev. I don't know, I couldn't tell you. I'm not, I'm not a Hebrew language, language expert. Why am I twindy? So I'm just here. It's located here just outside the Coral Synagogue. And essentially, it's a letter from the Jewish community in Kiev asking for financial aid to help release from prison uh, Ma Yaakov, who was a, um, you know, a Jewish man who had been wrongly kind of accused. Well, he wasn't accused. His brother, Ma Yaakov's brother, was caught, was guilty of stealing money. And uh, he was executed. But because uh, Ma Yaakov couldn't pay the money back, he was thrown into jail. And they raised 60 gold coins for him, or 60 coins for him. I couldn't tell you if they were gold or not. But they needed 40 more to actually, ex uh, to actually get him discharged rather than have him out on bail. So the letter was eventually found in Egypt. And uh, yeah, it's a very important document to find out about the old Kievan Rus ways of uh, the, ju the, ju the judicial system and uh, guarantoring and bail and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's incredibly valuable piece of artifact. So yeah, this is what the letter represents. So this is an interesting statue, I must say. So this is a, a love letter to the so old balconies of the Soviet Socialist Departments. So, you know, this was a place where, you know, where, you know, all, all the three generations would live in these apartments and the balcony would house all the crap and rubbish of, uh, you know, some people in the UK we call it a messy drawer. This would be a messy balcony. So, you know, skis for the winter, shovels for the, for the snow, and then gardening tools for the summer again, you know. So the spring and the summer, all this would be kept in there. Grandma's uh, refrigerator that hasn't worked for 20 years, but it'd be a shame to throw away. The bicycle you had when you were a kid, it can be used for your kid, keep it. These, these balconies were, you know, where you go to smoke, where you go to watch the sunset in the old so socialist apartments, you know. And then uh, eventually, you know, your kids are gonna find all this stuff and basically for a lot of it to charity or to the dump but hey it's here now so yeah i really like that one that was a that was a love letter to the socialist balconies the soviet balconies of the apartment blocks